and say, well, does that happen in reality? What does the evidence say? Let's go to the evidence. What does the evidence say? Okay? And there may be sort of no question more worked on in economics than the elasticity of labor supply or the shape of the labor supply curve. There is thousands of articles written on this question. Okay? And what I want to do here to make the intuition easy, I want to go back to the best literature circa probably 40 years ago when it was sort of the initial burst of interest in this in like the 1970s. 1970s is a burst of interest in this. And what the literature did was it looked separately at men and married women because most women were married and back then we didn't care about single women. Okay? Okay? It was, it was, it was a dark time. Okay? So the literature looked at men and women and married women and asked what was their elasticity of labor supply? Well, let's think for a second about what we'd expect. And to do that, let's think about the substitution effect and the income effect. Let's start with men. The male substitution effect. Let's start with substitution effect. Men versus married women. Who has a bigger substitution effect and why? That is, when the wage goes up, who, who has a bigger substitution response to that and why? Men or married women? Right. So it's actually married women because men are already working 40 hours. They can't, there's no, so think about a married man in 1975. Okay, men didn't raise their kids. Men, quite frankly, didn't give much of a shit about their kids. Okay? Men just worked. That's what men did in 1975. Okay? They worked and they worked their 40 hours and they went home. Okay, maybe they worked less or more than 40 hours. But certainly, the notion of saying, well, the wage went up, maybe I'll take more leisure, never really crossed a man's mind in 1975. Because what were they going to do? They had no one to play golf with. They didn't want to spend time with their kids. What were they going to do? Whereas women had a real substitution possibility. Okay, This was an era women were entering the labor force, the real opportunities for work. But it was also fine to hang out at home. You had a lot of your friends were hanging out at home. You could take care of your kids. There were a lot of things to do. So women had a much larger substitution effect than men. Okay, because men, what? Remember, what's the substitution effect? It's about the next best alternative. For men, there was no next best alternative. It was just work. You know, basically between nine to five on a weekday, there was nothing else to do. Okay, for women, there was other things to do, which is you could hang out with friends who weren't working, or you could take care of the kids. Yeah. What about like working overtime? Okay. Well, let's. But once again, if I'm a man, you might think that I could then. But then once again, if I work, oh, the substitution effect could work that way for overtime. But let's talk about just the decision to work at all at some shit, or the decision to work sort of your first 40 hours. Overtime's hard because then you get paid more, etc. Okay. Now let's go to the other side. Let's go to the income effect. So let's not say this is zero. Let's say it's small because this is big, and this is small. Because you can work a little bit of overtime or something like that, and some men didn't care about their kids. I'm obviously being facetious. Uh, so it could be some men, some men were willing to spend time with their kids, etc. Okay, now let's go to the income effect. For whom is the income effect going to be bigger? Men or women? For whom is the income effect going to be bigger? Yeah. Because, uh, because they're, they have a goal of like, they need X amount of money to survive for their family. So like, if they get a huge raise and wage, then they go to home all year and they can start doing more easier activities. Exactly. Th there's actually two reasons it's men. One, you're more likely to have a target income. Two is you can't have an income effect if you don't work. Okay, The income effect is proportional to how hard you were working. If you weren't working, then there's no income effect, right? Income effect is essentially, the income effect for labor is essentially the hours times dh dy. What Manny said was a reason why dh dy might be bigger for men than women, because they have these targets. More relevantly, if women weren't working, they didn't have the h. This is zero, so the income effect zero. So for men, this was big, and for women, this was small. Okay, put this together. And what does it suggest about the relative shapes of labor supply for men and women? Don't raise your hand and tell me. What does it suggest about the labor supply curve would look like for men and women in this era? Okay, 
given, given, we, given the intuition we talked about here, what does it suggest the female and male, the married women layer supply and the male layer supply curve should look like? Okay, well let's talk, what do we talk about? We talked about the substitution effect. If the wage goes up, it leads to more leisure, which means it leads to more labor supply. For men, it's not clear. You could very much get a Giffen effect here because basically there's not much opportunity for substitution, but they might work a lot less if they get rich. Okay? So that is sort of the, the that's, what I like this example, it's hard, but I like this example sort of illustrates how substitution effects can come together to get a little bottom answer, bottom line answer. What do we know? What we know is that actually evidence is that female layer supply was very elastic. That circa this era, female supply has an elasticity of between 0.5 and 1. That if you raised women's wage by 10%, there was a 5 to 10% increase in their labor supply, which is pretty, not elastic elastic, but reasonably elastic. Okay? Whereas for men, it was pretty much zero. It wasn't negative, it wasn't positive, it was basically zero. Basically, men just worked 40 hours and then went home. Okay? So basically, in an era where for women, the layer slide was very elastic and of the standard direction, higher wage leads you to work harder, an upward sloping supply curve. But for men, it was pretty much a vertical supply curve, maybe even a bit backward bending, maybe even a wrong sign supply curve. But pretty much you can think of it as zero. Okay? Now, what do we think has happened in the 40 years since to these two numbers? So in the last six women are between 0 0.5 and 1 and men of zero. What do we think has happened to these two numbers in the 40 years since these, these studies and why? What do we think has happened to these elasticity estimates and why? Yeah. Well, let's talk about women. What do you think has happened to the female estimate? Because? There are more of them are working in a primary role. Right. Well, first of all, this is going to come down. Because, in fact, it's now more standard just to work. Right? In fact, now, for a woman today, in many communities, it's like being in Manitine 70s, which is if you don't go to work, there's no one to hang out with. Okay, uh, so basically this is going to get smaller, and they're more of a primary earner in the family. So this is going to get bigger. So in fact, female labor supply has fallen more to like about an elasticity about 0.2. It's actually fallen over time. Now for men, the question is, do you get the opposite effect? After all, men sort of care more about their kids now, and there's more sort of activities going on during the day. But in fact, it hasn't. In fact, male labor supply still is pretty inelastic. What's happened is kids are now in childcare. So basically we've gone from a world where as wages went up, women went, as men worked, women either worked or didn't work depending on the wage, and if they worked, the kids went in childcare. Now men work and women work and kids are in childcare. And that's basically the change, the evolution of the labor, roughly speaking, obviously. Still female labor force participation is only about 70%. Okay, many women still do stay home and raise their kids and are in and out of the labor force. Okay, but by and large, we moved to a world with just overall less elastic labor supply. Yeah. The average like two parent household is, is richer now, or no? Or the average. Well, okay, we're going to get into this when we talk about income distribution. What this has done is allowed the average two family household to tread water. So the average two family household today has the same income as it did in the 1970s. Why? Because workers earn a ton less in real terms than they did, and that's facts about inequality. We'll come to. So basically the average family in America, despite having, going from the wife not working to the wife working, is no better off than they were 40 years ago. And that has lots of implications we'll talk about. Okay? So, any other questions about that? So let me end with one final example. Okay? An application. Okay? Which is to the problem, to the problem we have in the world of child labor. It's a huge problem around the world as kids being forced to work was a huge problem in the U.S. until the 20th century. It's a huge problem around the world because A, work can often be dangerous and bad for their health, but B, they can't be going to school and having an opportunity to better themselves. If a kid is spending all day working, then that kid is destined to a life of working in the same crappy job because there's no way to get the skills that allows them to grow and go further. Okay? Now, one, when we, t we will talk in the next few lectures, in a few lectures about international trade. And one criticism of international trade is people say, well, if you allow these developing countries to sell more stuff to the developed world, 
that will they'll put the kids to work more. So if we have free trade and Vietnam can suddenly sell a bunch of stuff to America, that's more kids are going to put to work making that stuff. So one common argument you hear against free trade is it's bad for kids. But in fact, that argument is not necessarily right because it ignores an important point. Manny? They don't believe they don't believe it isn't education really that well in that area. No, no, that, that, that's a different issue. The point, that, that's right. But the point it ignores is free trade makes families richer. And if families are richer, they may want to buy more education for their kids. So on the one hand, it's true free trade makes kids more valuable in the labor force. On the other hand, it makes family richer, and they want more education for their kids. So to look at that, two Dartmouth professors did a study. We looked at Vietnam and looked at what happened when Vietnam liberalized trade in rice. Okay, They could sell more rice because now they're selling to the whole world, not just to Vietnam. Okay, you don't need to notice the graph so much as the intuition. If you give someone a bigger market, they're going to make more stuff. Okay, yeah. In the competition with other countries, whereas if it, if it was just like if each country was just selling to itself, then Vietnam would have. Would have uh, would no, have they liberalized the sense that they let they let it set up. Then I didn't say they let more in. Okay, but we'll come back to international trade. Okay, so basically the point is there was there was this demand shock that allowed them to sell more rice. So what effect does that have on the market for child labor? Let's go to the highly complicated last figure and let me walk you through this. Here is the market for child labor. Okay? On the x-axis is the amount of child labor. On the y-axis is the wage of kids. Okay? We start at point one. Initial demand, initial supply. Wage one, L1. Now, we liberalize trade. And that leads to more demand for child labor because we want to produce more rice. So that shifts us out to D2 and point two. So we have more child labor. That's bad. But what this ignores is families are now richer. And with the income effect, they will buy their kids' education. They'll pull their kids out of working and put them in school. That's represented as a shift to the left of the supply curve. So we move from point two to point three through the income effect. Families are now richer. And indeed, if the income effect is large enough, you could move to point four you could actually have a reduction in child labor. Why? Because the benefits of more kids working in terms of producing more rice is exceeded by the value to the firms of taking their, of the families of taking the extra money they're making and putting into education for their kids. And in fact, the study showed <clears throat> that we did move to a point like point four. Okay, we actually found that child labor fell when they liberalized trade. That the that the, ar the intuitive argument that, gee, if they sell more, more kids are going to work is wrong. That, in fact, when you sell more, yes, more kids demand for more kids, but families are so rich, they put their kids in education rather than in their fields. Okay? And that is a wonderful sort of counterintuitive story of how what economists, I'll talk about economists like free trade.